This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network. Parental discretion is advised. There are so many streaming TV series. So many channels. I have a stream. I just don't know which one to watch. Is this show worth our time? I have a stream. I'm three seasons behind already. Is it even worth catching up? I have a stream. What's the series about? Well, my wife liked it too. I have a stream. What channel is it on? And who's in it? I have a stream. I want to watch something new, something original. I have a stream. I want to watch something that's action packed. I have a stream. Upcoming episodes of The Last Dance. Fans get a behind the scenes look at Michael Jordan's big return to basketball in the Chicago Bulls. TJ Holmes has more from Madison Square Garden, which was Michael Jordan's favorite place to play. TJ, good morning. Yeah, you say it's his favorite place because the man averaged 31.8 points a game here for a career. That's the highest ever of any player who ever visited here. The series itself is also has the highest average viewers of any documentary in ESPN history. And this Sunday is going to focus on two moments that MJ shocked the world when he retired from basketball and when he decided to return. Are you uncomfortable about remembering the past? Thank you. Very good brother to me. Your brother seriously mentally ill. Why do you insist on turning this around on me? Because you're his twin, aren't you? Stand up for me for once. Stream is a show about streams. As conscious beings, we slip into a different stream as often as every minute of every day. Our lives are, after all, a trip through different streams of consciousness. This show is focused on streaming television series and television history. We'll try to find a stream that's worth the time you invest in watching it. That's the main stream of our show about streams. We'll visit other streams briefly from time to time, but always come back to our main show stream. Let's face it, if you're here, the television is a guilty pleasure for both of us. Appropriately, and I suppose ironically, the show's final resting spot will be as a stream. So let's get started, shall we? What's happening, bar flies? This is the I Have a Stream podcast on Bears Bar Room Radio Network, coming to you live on Mixler.com. This is John Santucci, call me Tooch, and I got in the sidecar with me Danny Aguirre and a special guest behind the bar. Danny, how are you tonight? 
I am well, and we're late because of me. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Can I? Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, the celebrity bartender. Give me one second. He's a two-time Emmy Award-winning producer, the founder of the Bears Barroom Radio Network, the barkeeper himself, Aldo Gandia. Come inside. How cool is that? <laughs> ah, the bartender. <laughs> How are you guys doing, man? Thanks for having me on. This is cool. Oh, doing great. We got a great show. We're going to talk about Chicago Bulls Last Dance episodes seven and eight. Man, what a great series. I hope you guys are enjoying this one. This, to me, this is the series that saved quarantine, Aldo. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> And uh, we're going to talk, uh, as always, streaming television. Danny and I have been watching I Know This Much Is True, the first episode on HBO. Did you catch that one, Aldo? I Know This Not Much yet. Is True. That's uh, Mark, Mark Ruffalo. Uh, That's why we're here, isn't it? Yes. Is that the <laughs> featured discussion to talk about episode one of the Mark Ruffalo uh, acting extravaganza? Yeah, we're going to catch that one and uh, recap episode one. Uh, of the uh, latest HBO serial series, and we'll talk. We'll have the news. Aldo and I are going to deliver the news tonight. Woo-hoo! Yeah, and uh, we're also going to talk some recommendations. I'll I'll go first with the. Uh, well, wait. Let's let's get some drinks. I guess. Huh? I almost forgot. I always forget. <laughs> <laughs> How could you forget? <laughs> uh, Aldo, just uh, a, my usual, just uh, a bourbon and two fingers, two rocks. All right. Nice. Pour that baby down there. There you go. Drink up, brother. And uh, Dan, uh, a Gatorade again? I'll go with the beer tonight. How about nice. most ice? All right. Nice Cheap beer. Excellent choice. Yeah, that's good shit. Cool. Very like, nice. Like that foamy top, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> sucks there, but I'll take it. <laughs> I heard you were a tits and suds guy. <laughs> I'm anything that you, it, to do with the female anatomy. I think. So. Uh, <laughs> Fat Fat Mike is in the chat room and he recognized the song that we brought in with Aldo. Is here come the mummies. Oh, yeah, look one at of my this favorite. Guy. One of my favorite bands. Uh, they always hit the summer concert tours and i'm usually i try to catch them wherever they can they put on a great live show and of course as you know aldo they dress as mummies and they play right. they play <laughs> funk and all the all the lyrics are sex about sex and partying that's why i love them <laughs> so uh, Maybe you can see them live again in 2023 <laughs> that's right if you're alive right. that's right we're gonna, we'll do a little tales from quarantine i have a disturbing article i read recently and uh, Aldo, what are you going to have? I uh, am uh, drinking a little tequila, uh, silver tequila, 1800, yes. On, uh, on the rocks, or? Straight up, brother. Straight up, man. How about an extra tall one? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All the way to the top. <laughs> Aldo-sized uh, serving. <laughs> Call me tomorrow, Fat Mike. I'll be hungover. <laughs> Uh, all right <laughs> cheers everybody cheers uh, cheers let's uh a little uh what are you watching currently man i am binging a very bingeable show if uh you guys like the movie braveheart yes of course Mel gibson yeah, yeah. braveheart uh, I'm i'm binging outlander i never saw it before it's uh, it's been on my list for quite a long time it's really good and enjoying it it's, it's uh it's on stars i believe it's also yeah. on netflix so it goes. It'll go fast. You can binge them back to back. The episode's about fifty minutes long, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm enjoying that one. It's a good one to watch with the wife or significant other. Uh, although, did you see Outlander? 
I have never seen an episode of Outland. Uh, I've heard some good things about it. Very good show. If you like Braveheart, that sort of thing, the Scottish and English warring, this takes place in... It starts around World War II, and uh, the main character is magically transported by, you know, a circle of stones of magic, you know, stones like Avebury or Stonehenge, back to 200 years, 1743, and, you know, the the Jacobite Revolution in uh, Scotland, you know, the wars versus the English, the Redcoats, and, uh, you know, she spends time living among the Scots and trying to get back to her husband in ni- in the 1940s and man it's really good great acting great stories uh every series kind of cliff hangs into the next one so it's every every episode so, what about you aldo what are you watching right now anything uh, you can recommend to the audience of i have a stream well i just finished uh, binging season two i'm a season behind on the ozarks uh Whoa. and what a fabulous series that is. I'm so excited to start season three coming up. Uh, and I just got to give a shout out to, uh, uh, what's his first name? Justin Bateman. Yeah, Jason uh, Bateman is awesome. Jason, and thank you. He is a phenomenal talent. I mean, as an actor and now behind the camera, you know, obviously he was involved with the HBO show, The Outsiders. He uh, starred in a couple of episodes and directed uh, a couple of episodes, maybe even more than a couple. Uh, so he's just proven himself to have gone from child actor to uh, a grade A actor and uh, producer director in my book. So shout out to him for uh, a great season of the Ozarks and uh, can't wait to start season three. Uh, season three, I think, in my opinion, the best season of the three. So mm-hmm. in for a treat. Now, does your wife watch Ozark as well? Yes. She, uh, she enjoys just- the show. She she enjoys that as well. She finds it a little dark at times. You know, she doesn't go for a lot of the violence and stuff. But uh, you know, I I force her to sit through it, and and she walks away happy that she did. I I also just finished uh, season one and two of uh, a, a show that I'm sure you guys talked about in the past. Uh, you on Netflix, right? It's yeah, that's uh, <laughs> crazy. Uh, I I have not seen it. I know I. It's on my list as well. It's oh. one, I, one I probably will start soon. But, yeah, I heard it's very good. Yes, it really okay. is. If you're a fan of the Showtime series Dexter, oh, uh, I yeah. think you'll like this uh, because this is a story of a guy who uh, falls in love with this woman, and he goes to all lengths to uh, get her to fall in love with him. And I'm talking about uh, murder. <laughs> 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 if you mess around with the girl that he's infatuated with or in love with, he will kill you. <laughs> so, uh, season one and two are uh, uh, season two feels a little too much like season one for the first several episodes, and then all of a sudden there's some fabulous plot twists. Uh, highly recommended. Oh, nice. uh, and then I'm going to give you one more um, love as a guilty pleasure. I'm not sure if you're doing this segment or not later. But I'll give this to you now. A guilty pleasure on Netflix. There's a really stupid show called Love is Blind. Mm. And it is, uh, if you're into these uh, stupid dating reality shows, <laughs> it just has a, uh, a crazy premise where they've invited, uh, I don't know, a couple of dozen uh, people uh, and they uh, interact with, some, uh, with people from the opposite sex uh, behind a a uh, a window where you cannot see the person that you're talking to so the premise is is that you get to know this person you get to know the, their personalities what makes them tick and so forth to see if you can fall in love with them without the uh w- without the uh, physical attraction mm. and so wow. that's how yeah it's a it's a very very interesting premise and then uh, after they have decided whether love is blind or not, in some cases, some people have, you, you have to, at the end of these two weeks of just talking to people, you have to then decide whether you're going to propose marriage and try to make it work, or not. if not, then you're off the show. And so a handful of uh, couples decide to give marriage a try, and it just becomes a reality show <laughs> Uh, meat for for people. It's oh. a really really guilty pleasure, but uh, I I enjoy it. <laughs> I forgot that was uh, there's that one show. I was thinking was it 90 Day Fiance or something like that. I, do you remember that show? Yeah, I, I 
Yeah, I have not seen that one. Uh, uh, actually, I have seen some episodes of that. I, my, I take that. My back. wife and I were almost on that show. Really? When I was, uh, it, we didn't. It didn't fit the timeline because uh, we were, you know, doing our visa uh, too soon for that. They takes too. They had too much prep time. But uh, producers were, you know, emailing me like a couple dozen times a week. You know. Trying to uh, wow. find out the story and everything like that. So, uh, you guys would have been great I can't for that. The name of the show, yeah, it would have been great. But they they like they like the unhappy stories, although <laughs> they want the uh, yeah. strife and stress and you know, oh, yes. things to yes. things to not work out. So, but yes. exactly, Dan- the woman looked for a sugar daddy instead of yeah. Love. Yeah. disappearing into the night when they arrive. <laughs> right. <laughs> Danny, what you got going on? Are you watching anything you could recommend? I don't have anything new per se, but I got a, an update on a show that I've talked about before, and I have a movie that I've been trying to oh. keep every week. I'm like, oh, fuck, I meant to tell you about that. But anyway, <laughs> let me start. Uh, a show that I've mentioned several times from Showtime called Black Monday, mm. where Don Cheadle's actually received an Emmy nomination for like best lead actor actor Mm. it was interrupted due to the coronavirus because i guess they weren't done with post-production so they were in the middle of their second season and had to literally stop it they've announced that it's going to come back uh, late june 28th 29th somewhere through there but initially it come it basically starts the show starts in 86 and leads up to the stock market crash in 87 but it's it's very vulgar (laughs) <laughs> lots of drug use and lots of cool things like when they get their first Nintendo, all these like <laughs> 80s kind of things that I can remember. Right. Uh, and the guy, if you watch the HBO show Girls, uh, which I, I love that Adam Driver came off of that, uh, okay. Lena Dunham. But yes. Lena Dunham's, uh, he, he happens to be gay on the show. I think he is in real life too, not that I give a shit, but it, he played her gay friend Elijah on there. He's also on Black Monday. Hmm. I can't think of the guy's name's Andrew or something. I, but I, I, I recommend show. show Black. Nice. It's on Showtime. Right. Showtime like I said, it's pretty good uh, for the series too. They're probably, you know, for the for the add-on premium services, I, I'm going to rank Showtime, you know, number two behind HBO. I agree with that. Uh, lastly, uh, that movie I was telling you about, and I know Aldo from talking to him enough about the movies that we like in similar genres i i can't uh, advocate enough watching the gentleman the gentleman it's got matthew mcconaughey hmm. uh hugh grant and colin farrell hmm. it's again extremely vulgar the only downside was Wait, that's the that, guy Ritchie. that is correct oh man i the, wanted to see that where, where where can we find that one i watched it on pay-per-view okay. i've got direct TV still for sunday ticket right. so uh, the only downside is some of the characters are really British, so I had to turn on the uh, subtitles yep. because when it starts to get too British, it might as well be fucking Japanese for me. <laughs> uh, but I was following along, and I think it's great. There was a part where a guy ends; they take a, a just one small spoiler. They make they get a guy high and make him fuck a cow, mm. or so, or was it a, a pig? We're gonna have to get uh, Barrelissimo to translate for you Dan. <laughs> <laughs> how is he doing uh didn't he think he had the coronavirus a, a few weeks ago a, few, a month ago or so yeah yeah he was about six weeks ago he's doing fine he's fully recovered and uh and back at it so yeah I thought, well i saw a story today that said if you have contracted the virus you're supposed to wait 30 days after being well before you fuck again because you can still transmit mm. it so or, I heard sex was good for fighting the coronavirus. So I'm, <laughs> That's what I uh, choose to believe. <laughs> there was a guy in New Zealand. I'll quit rambling. Uh, that uh, over there, they were, he's a subway employee, and they want you to they track your movements. If you go out to eat and things like that, they want your name, your email address, and mm. stuff. And so he was nefariously taking the females that were coming into subway, getting their info, and then fucking hitting on them. <laughs> And trying to get dates and pussy right. out of it. So, uh, yeah, I've had anyway, that. he's been. I've had female coworkers who told me similar stories. They go out uh, to get like supplies from work, you know, and the the uh, the guy uh, at whatever wherever they went writes down their info and then later calls them. <laughs> you know, it's uh, like tries to pick them up. You know? Is that ever going to work? So inappropriate. Is there one? Is there one guy that does that? Then it and it actually works. One guy. Is there one instance? I doubt. I doubt it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's almost like uh, being the one guy who has a super fan obsession with a celebrity actress. You're the one guy that she's going to fucking say, okay, come on over. <laughs> Taylor Swift's going to fuck you, bro. It's, uh, you, you mentioned Sunday Ticket uh, a while yes. back. Is that, is that Sunday Ticket going to be the same? I, I'm waiting for that to go away where I can oh, just order the games up. from... NFL Network themselves because the Sunday I've got a Sunday, Sunday ticket, ticket is the worst. <laughs> I have a Sunday ticket nightmare story for you if you want me to ramble a little bit longer. Long story short, I had the Sunday ticket Max last year. Uh, I don't want the Max this year because I I watch the games in in my own living room as opposed to the phone. Well, that means you have to call Directv, <laughs> and ever since Directv was purchased by AT and T, they literally have outsourced. All of their customers. Yeah. I'm not trying to say political. Yep. I'm just saying when you your business is communicating and you cannot communicate, yeah. it's a shit. You're story. calling India or so the I, Philippines for your, to no, talk to the, somebody. The, the lady that called me was from fucking Israel. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I made a joke to Phil. I said the fucking Christians are fucking me again. But anyway, that's a joke. <laughs> but uh, pro Palestine. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. I'm, I'm just. I don't want to be political. But the, it, this is what happened. The, I called and I said, look, I don't want. Sunday Ticket Max, and we went through it like five times, and then I checked my email, and she charged me for 2020 Max. <laughs> so I called back a second time and said, I didn't want the Max, that's what I called for. And she says, okay, I understand. And then she charged me for the regular Sunday Ticket, but all on one, one lump sum as opposed to the installments. So then I called a third time trying to get the installments, and they're like, I don't know what we can do to fix this. We'll have to call you back. And the lady called back from Israel and said it's fixed. But you just know when that bill comes in next month, it's going to be the whole $293. Oh, Gar sure. Jesus. Yeah, guaranteed. guaranteed. Yeah, wait, wait for that contract to end so I can just order the games through NFL Network, you know? 2022 is okay. when there's, their contract that runs out. <laughs> Can't come soon enough. Hey, uh, before we move mm -hmm. on, I just have a comment regarding uh, Dan's recommendation of The Gentleman, which I'm definitely going to see because I'm a Guy Ritchie yeah. fan. I think he's a fabulous director. Snatch all-time classic. Yeah, and you talked about, Dan, about the accents uh, in the movie. Well, in that uh, in the movie with Brad Pitt. Yeah. Uh, Snatch. 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 That's, you yeah, know, that was awesome. Classic, that man. A great, great movie, and and Brad Pitt was supposed to do a London accent, but he couldn't pull it off. So Guy Ritchie decided to have him speak Pikey, yeah. which means that no one could understand what he was saying. It was awesome. Every time he spoke, <laughs> it was such a comedic genius. I mean, I was laughing my ass off. In the do you like dags? That. Yeah, I like I like dags. <laughs> Oh, you I'm mean dogs? To, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to watch that with subtitles wow, then. I think classic. I saw that at the movie theater. Dennis Faria. Uh, I the, the completely lost. I, I can't understand anything that's being said right now. Yep. <laughs> it was. It was. One, uh, it's yeah, classic. It was. Yeah, lock, smoke, <laughs> lock, stock, and two smoking barrels also classic. That was the precursor to Snatch, which is all, yes. also really good. Not quite as humorous as Snatch. but uh, Speaking of Snatch, wasn't he married to Madonna? <laughs> Guy Ritchie was married to Madonna, yep. That's right. He was. And uh, <laughs> the gentleman is supposed to be in the vein of Snatch and Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, though. I have not seen it yet. I'm waiting to see it. It's so fucking great. Colin Farrell's awesome in it, too. McConaughey, actually, even though he's the star, it feels like he kind of isn't in it as much as everybody else. Right. It was like, uh, well, Benicio Toro, Del Toro was uh, got a, a, a top billing in Snatch, and he... Uh, he was hardly yeah. in it too. <laughs> yeah. I love Benicio. <laughs> yes, great act. All right. So uh, I wanted to talk about an article I read recently, although I mentioned it to you uh, before we came on the air. Uh, it was about have we seen the last of shopping malls and movie theaters as the pandemic, you know, killed off the way we think of going to the mall or the movies, you know, when it. Now that streaming services have offered, you know, first-run movies in the comfort of your home, is there is there any need now to go out to the movie theater other than maybe perhaps changing the experience of the movie theater? I, in my opinion, I think that the movie theater will always be around as long as it is safe, uh, and and I. I in my heart believe that uh, there will be a time where we'll get back to normal uh, it, and normal being 
that we can go to a crowded movie theater, but there will be, you know, things like sanitizer that you will put on your hands and you might have to wear masks for a year or two. There will be some changes in day to day life. But I, I believe that uh, movie theaters are going to be around. People want the experience of, of watching a theatrical film alongside other people. You just enjoy laughing with people. You enjoy crying with people you enjoy being at the edge of your seat with people i don't think that the theatrical movie experience is going to go away and the only thing that could really kill it is the economics yeah, and that's you part know, of we'll, my worry as I, well i bet it yeah I, be, I bet that was covered in the yeah, in the article sure. right for sure the uh and, and yeah. you know it just doesn't seem like while we're in the midst of this it doesn't seem like things are going to get back to normal after this experience. You know, it just feel I mean, I know they will. It just doesn't feel like it. You know, also the shopping mall experience, or, you know, pe people seem to l tend trending towards reluctance to venture out into places where big crowds will be because of this pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, for fear of contracting something the next the next coronavirus, you know, because every so often it seems like we're we're getting one of these bugs that just gets mm -hmm. harder and harder to you know overcome for our health professionals and then aside from the shopping mall, i think yeah. we talked about this a little bit last week danny was the the movie theater perhaps might have to change to being more uh sensory experience uh centered perhaps motion uh chairs uh virtual reality headsets uh, I remember John Waters had a film that was in Smellovision or something. I think in, in the yeah, in the eighties, right. one of his movies right. came. I think it was. It I was, would uh, just smell what John Waters has in his film. Po polyester, I think, was in <laughs> Smellovision. You had a scratch and sniff card. Don't know if anybody remembers that. Uh, a, a scratch yeah, and sniff that. card. Sure. You would, at certain points of the movie, you would scratch the card, and you'd get the aroma of the uh, of the. <laughs> Did you see Pink Flamingos? <laughs> I I uh, it was on I think Turner Classics uh, a month or oh, two really? ago, and I got through. Yeah, and I got through about thirty minutes of it. And I said, "No, I, I can't." <laughs> There's a scene where the crossdresser literally eats dog shit. It's exactly. most real it was, dog uh, shit. Divine, exactly. right? What's Divine it? was the. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's probably. To right. just follow up to your theatrical yes. story. Uh, my local, the most local of theaters, because like everybody else, even though I'm in West Virginia, we have you know multiple theaters. But uh, the most local for me, the closest to my house, is a company called AMC, which I don't know if it's connected to the channel AMC, but nonetheless, they announced about a week ago that they're pissed off at movies produced by Universal uh, because they're delivering. Uh, like an on-demand kind of at-the-house experience and apparently are going to move forward with that even if the pandemic uh, circumvents itself and, you know, and, and people can go back out and it's mitigated. The point is they said they will not show any movies from Universal at any AMC mm. theater moving wow. forward. Yeah. So you could have contract disputes like that with other smaller or bigger chains as well. It's kind of like one of those situations where your local affiliates may not be on direct TV until the, the deal gets done. It's, it's just another thing, another variable to uh, go along with uh, the, the coronavirus. Yeah, the on demand, too, with streaming services has also kind of made people realize that perhaps, you know, hey, maybe we just watch it at home. We order, make our own food or order a pizza, you know, at home, sit in our own couch, our own recliner. You know, and uh, enjoy the movie with at home, away from crowds. But uh, yeah. But if you're if you're single and you're wanting a place to go on a date, yeah, that's what I was going to say earlier. You all were talking about will right. the movie experience be the way it is? If you need somewhere to go, the movie is like a go to. Yeah. You know, Good like point, Danny. Especially yeah. like if you haven't had sex with the lady yet, and you're trying to like not even try to have so, but you just <laughs> that awkward. Although, getting how to long know you've been somebody. married for? <laughs> it's like all, all this is like in the past for Aldo and I. We're just like take it for granted. But Danny's still out. Oh, Danny's yeah. still out there on the hunt. <laughs> I'm freshly divorced from a, what, a year ago now. So yeah, uh, that's the point. You got to have uh, you know places mm -hmm. to go, man. I mean, uh, other than just eating. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, and you guys were talking about this a sensory uh, thing. I remember back in the 
in the mid 1970s there was a disaster pick uh called earthquake and uh, i was a, a teenager i don't know 14 15 years old at the time read about it and the they promoted it as the the theater will actually you will actually oh, yeah. feel like you're earthquake and so i went to one of the downtown chicago theaters and what they had done is they set up these big bass woofer <laughs> uh, speakers at the front of the theater and so every time there was an earthquake on the screen they just jacked up the audio and this and the entire theater was vibrating <laughs> from these woofers and the funny funny fucking thing was is that it's it it awoken all of the rats <laughs> in the movie theater I felt like I was in a movie Ben or Willard, one of the rat movies and stuff, watching an earthquake movie. It was hilarious. Scattering. And I was, which uh, which I'm theater was that? It was the United Artists on okay. Dearborn and uh, Dearborn and uh, well, what street is that? Uh, Dearborn and uh, Washington. Okay, so I the theater was. district. Right. Yes, exactly. All right. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, you guys want to talk a little Last Dance episode 7 and 8? Uh, yeah, right. I, uh, episode 7 starts, of course, with the, the death of Michael's dad. You know, that whole... I'd, I'd forgotten about that, that, you know, he was murdered after he pulled over on the side of the road. You know, and that really... I, I'd forgotten how much that affected him. Probably led toward his retirement. Uh, although, what do you think? His dad wasn't around I'm to so share his... He was, dad was at, at almost all of his games, or... As many as he could get to. I think that had a huge reason uh, for why he retired. I think he, he just was going through hell uh, with the murder of his father. And I think he was also just mentally wasted and not having his father there to help push him and help get him going for a fourth straight championship yeah. uh, probably had something to do with it. Although he does share in the documentary that he spoke with his dad and said that he was going to quit and play baseball, and his dad encouraged him to pursue baseball. So, you know, perhaps that wasn't the case. Perhaps he was just destined to take a year or two off from basketball because it was mentally grueling, particularly all the stuff that was going on off the court. And, um, uh, and, and you know, it, it, to me, it was it was probably the best thing that happened to him because he came back better than ever, or as good as ever, and uh, helped propel them to to uh, three more uh, championships. So um, it, it it was definitely you know uh, a, a motivating factor. I think his, his the death of his father. Now I, I'm dying to hear Dan's uh, take on what he didn't like about this show because he, he kind of clues. I love it. I love it, just like everybody says, great TV, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But, but yeah, I'm going to be the asshole this week. There were three things that stood out to me that just was like, oh my god, this is propaganda. Like if you were, uh, if 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 you were aligned with Aldo and myself, we would immediately shit on Fox News. If you're on the other side, you would, you know, you get the point. You're going to say that the left is full of shit, and that's the kind of thing that this seems like akin to that. Like for example, you're talking about baseball. And I know some people will say, well, he hadn't played since he was like 18 or 19. And to hit 202 is quite an accomplishment. It is. Okay. Oh, okay. But name me one other 202 hitter in double A that you would have like Terry Francona or anybody else in a documentary saying, I tell you what, this guy could have been great. This guy could have made it to all the way to the white side. I wonder, yeah. If you're in double A. If you're not Michael Jordan, if he was Brian Jordan, who actually made it to the big leagues in, in both sports, or even Ricky Jordan, remember him from the <laughs> Phillies? Uh, if he's any other Jordan other than Michael, does anybody say he's going to go to the big leagues batting 202? And I would say no, unequivocally. I, I no. never thought he did. So I this, never thought he would, but I didn't know that uh, they wanted to start him in rookie ball, which is below A ball. But the press, press facilities below AA weren't big enough to accommodate the media, is what they said in the documentary. I don't know how much of that is true. But uh, he had to start at AA, which, you know, like you said, not having played baseball since he was a lot younger. But uh, w w I did find it humorous that he started off with a 13-game hitting streak until because nobody was, nobody was throwing him breaking balls. As soon as, soon as he got a steady <laughs> diet of curveballs, he couldn't hit shit. <laughs> right, right. 
But I, I will say this, that um, it, 202 is definitely not impressive, but it is impressive when you factor in that the guy had not played ball since he was a kid and that he um, – was ba- basically had to relearn the game yeah. and was and was forced to, you know, play at a minor league level that was beyond his capabilities. Like uh, Tooch just said, he should have started off in rookie ball and worked his way up. But uh, I do believe that the the the, the uh, clubhouse thing was was a factor and that they couldn't fit all the media there, so that's why they sent him to Double A. But I, I'm not I'm not making excuses for the 202, and I don't know for sure if he would have uh, become a major leaguer. But I don't think that Terry Francona would have lied about it. I think Terry Francona is a as a legit and very successful uh, baseball manager at the minors and major league levels. I think he, he shared an uh, an honest assessment, and he thinks that you know if this guy would have had another fifteen hundred at bats, he probably would have had a a batting average up there around two sixty with his speed. He probably would have stolen twenty five bases. He had fifty. Uh, let's see, I got it in front of me. He had fifty one RBIs uh, that season, hitting two oh two. So he was definitely getting some clutch hits. So who knows? He could have per- potentially been a, a halfway decent decent major. Leaguer. I mean, he's just such an incredible oh, athlete, you know. He had a huge strike yeah. zone too, Aldo, at six foot six. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is funny that they finally figured out how to throw him a curveball after a thirteen game inning streak or whatever yeah, it was. <laughs> a couple things stand out for me. I I never realized how short Jerry Krause was. I mean, they show him walking oh. off on that one thing where he says, "You hear me? There's nobody, there's no dissension here. You hear me?" And then he he, he cuts the <laughs> press conference short. And he walks away. He looks like a <laughs> hobbit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and let me tell you something. At these final two episodes coming up Sunday, I have a feeling he is. I mean, he's already been gored <laughs> like a a pig on Memorial Day, and I I just feel like he he's really gonna get it because. Hey, let's face it. You know, this team won three more uh, championships when uh, Jordan came back from baseball. Yeah. And hell, uh, the only the only thing that stopped them from at least competing for the fourth was Jerry Krause. Uh, let's face it. And I remember how I felt back then with like Krause kept saying, you know, Phil is not no matter what, Phil won't be cut. It's like, come, you know, let the fans have the season. You know, when I was uh, mm-hmm. I, I was in my twenties, I was almost thirty when they won that last championship. I think I just turned thirty years old, and uh, I had just been. It was a rough season that you know that season it was grueling. You know, they're building up to that Jazz, you know, se- uh, finals. But uh, the mm-hmm. whole thing with like this will be Phil's last season. This is the Bulls' last season. Michael's not going to play if Phil's not here, and all that stuff. It kind of you know, gave the season a, a, a bad taste in my mouth for for a yeah. lot of it. But yeah. uh, I yeah. hey, let me ask Dan a question because Dan, you, you one of the things that you said before we went live is that you felt like that the documentary was really like sucking his dick. Yeah, what, there's two yeah. more things that were really bothering mm-hmm. me. Okay, two. please, please show us. yeah. Okay, one of which is the 19. Well, maybe I'll do it. Well, let me rewind. I was going to say talk about Gary Payton, but let me rewind. The 95 thing, when they lost to Orlando. Yes, you reminded us of that last they, week. <laughs> you know the documentary. Again, I have not, I'm not anti-Jordan or anti-Bulls. I come up from a different perspective because I'm not a Bulls fan per se. But again, Jordan was so great. And I saw all of his run with from like his third year on, fourth year on, whatever. I didn't see the first couple of years. But I'm just saying, I'm not one of these guys, uh, Johnny Come Lately. I saw it, right. you know. I have no re. I didn't dislike him. Like, I, like uh, first off, like Brian, the Russell thing in '98. They're going to talk about. I thought was a fucking offensive foul. We hit. We hit that a few weeks ago. And I was rooting for the Bulls. I hated the Jazz. So, uh, but anyway, get to the point. With the, um, they made it seem like well, '96. The reason they won 72 games is because Michael started working out the day after the Magic beat them. Come on, man. The reason they won in 96, 7, and 8 were not the only reason, but the main determining factor was the fact 
that Dennis Rodman was in San Antonio and said that Elijah Wan beat the dog shit out of David Robinson. He said the Admiral was soft, and he said Greg Popovich, who was the GM at the time, wants to be the coach, and he's duplicitous. So the Spurs said, fuck this guy. We're trading him to the Bulls for who do you got? Uh, Will Purdue? We'll fucking take him. We don't want him. We don't. And first, you remember a few years ago, and they, they, uh, the Lakers trade for Chris Paul, and David Stern stepped in and said, "That's not fair. We can't do it." This is, should have been the same scenario. Will Purdue for Dennis Rodman? <laughs> but anyway, that yeah. fucking trade on itself possibly gave them the three championships. Not that Michael started to work out again and turn into Rocky Balboa. Come on, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, to no, be well, fair, there aren't I, that I, many seven just, footers in the league. You know, yeah, I, I see your point. See that? I don't, I don't, I, I see the point, and I think you make it, you, you, you speak of it eloquently. But I think the thing to remember also is that not only, you know, Dennis Rodman was a cancer on that Spurs team. He was sitting out games, he was acting loony all over again. That's right. when it started dying his hair. And, and the, the league was just talking about that this guy had lost it. When Dennis Rodman was traded for Will Purdue, a player of no talent whatsoever, I was still upset because. Because I said, this guy, he's a nutcase. There's no I way, I so no way he's he going to succeed with the Bulls. He's going to cancel. Yeah. After, we saw yeah. him with the, with the Pistons. You know, we saw him. Yeah, he was a bully. I, I, he was a I, dirty I, I, player. Exactly. We're like, he's coming here. It's like, oh, then, we, then you go to like him every time. I would be like, what's his hair going to look like this time? You know, I, gotta, I confess <laughs> to wanting to know how he was going to do his hair. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I, 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 I do get your point, Dan, is that, you know, Rodman was a huge factor. In fact, I've heard arguments where the first three-peat team was better than the second three-peat team. No effing way. Rodman would have shut down Horace Grant, and Horace Grant will have been nullified. The few points that Horace would have scored, he would not have scored them. The rebounds that Horace would have got, he would not have gotten them. So uh, Rodman and, and that second three-peat, that was just a better all-around team because of Rodman and Jordan coming back with a fire that – that was as intense as ever. I agree. The second was better too, because you got Ron Harper. You have Ku Coach by that point, and I'm not a big Luke Longley guy, but I mean, I, I've just never been sold on Bill Cartwright. And again, well, I said before previous episodes, I thought Oakley was better for the Bulls. But I'm, anyway, yeah. uh, I think the second three P team is better. But the start of that three P team was the 72 wins against Seattle, which is the part I took umbrage with more than any. Uh, when they were showing in the documentary this week. Now, again, I feel like I've become an apologist for Isaiah Thomas in the last couple of weeks, and I'll own that because, again, I like I've said before, the 88 finals stands out to me so much and just how courageous he was and all this. And I felt like uh, the documentary basically is, everyone said, well, Isaiah's a dick, fuck him. But, man, what he, what Jordan did with Gary Payton – Mm -hmm. deserves a lot of criticism. So the Bulls are up 3-0, and they say, well, George Carl didn't want to play the glove on Jordan because didn't want to tire him out playing defense, and they needed him to, to run the point. They needed him on offense, essentially. So they make the strategic change to say, no, you, you, okay, you got you to gotta guard Jordan. Which, again, if you're talking about 91, that was what, in Bulls lore, is what turned the series around when you put Scottie Pippen on Magic Johnson. So... When they put Gary Payton on Jordan, they do win the next two games. And Jordan statistically in game four didn't do so well. I don't have the stats right in front of me. The point is Gary Payton did make a difference, and Gary Payton is a Hall of Famer. And uh, Gary Payton said, I'm not saying we would have won, but maybe it turns the series around a little bit if I'm playing him from game one on. I think that's a fair assessment. And when Jordan's watching it on the iPad, he just fucking laughs. He laughs and is like, oh, uh, uh, Gary Payton, he had no fucking problems with him. I mean, give, give, give somebody some credit. You obviously did have some problems with him. They won two straight games. And you could say, yeah, they made the switch. We figured out a way to still beat it. We won the title in six. I mean, but to me, that that showed Jordan in a really poor light. He's unable to give anybody any credit. And does anybody really doubt now that he had anything to do with Isaiah not being on the Dream Team? Come on, man. He fucking did. 
But this documentary piece a few weeks ago has been jerking off saying, oh, no, no, Jordan didn't do that. That is uh, the nature of Jordan Eves, you know. And he, they, a lot, I mean, he had the reputation of being a dick. You know, he was ultra competitive, hyper competitive. I love, the guy. I love him. I'm not a Bulls fan, but I love him. Like I said, I, I, want, I want to love him. It's 2020. It, can't you give somebody else credit now? I mean, it's okay to say Gary Payton – made a, a you know a fact would oh, become a factor Payton, when they put one him of the greatest me. defensive players of all time yeah, uh, you can say that and say well we were still better we still won we would have won anyway I, i'm okay with that for him to laugh at gary payton no. though come on I wanna, man. I, 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 yeah. can i just disagree <laughs> <laughs> i hate to play the contrarian here because i love dan and, and but my true feelings on it are, are that I, I don't think Gary Payton necessarily did a great job against Jordan in that game. Now, Jordan, in my opinion, had a he just had a poor shooting day, and I believe him when he said I had something else on my mind, and it was clear. They were up three to nothing, and he was thinking about his father. He was thinking about his father not being there when he's winning the championship, which is why he had that dramatic breakdown after they won in game six. Now, I'm looking at the stats right in front of me of that game. Jordan scored 23 points, but he did hit just six out of 19 shots for a 316th field goal percentage. But you want to know why maybe they lost? Uh, more so than Jordan's poor shooting or Gary Payton's great defense was Scottie Pippen was four out of 17 for 23 th- percent and only had nine points and uh, uh, and uh, that to me was it's just a, a total team loss when your top two players you know shoot uh, at a, a combined 30 percent you're going to lose and I don't think it had a, a, as much to do with Gary Payton's great defense as it just had to do with a total breakdown by the whole team they were up three to nothing they were reading their own press clippings they were uh, they, they were sailing and also the fact that Jordan didn't have that killer instinct because he was g- uh, grieving his dad that's that's my thought I can't disagree with anything you're saying. I mean, what I, what I was saying to me is just an opinion and, and certainly not a fact. Sure. Sure. Uh, and again, your opinion sounds completely credible and rational, so I don't want to sound like I'm just contradicting you. My only argument, again, is to say that it feels like if this were a piece that wasn't sort of pro- – Jordan's pro- like production company wasn't involved, maybe it wouldn't just be so one-sided in the analysis – is what I'm saying. I think that it really slights Gary Payton, who I think was a great player. And I didn't like the Sonics. Again, I was a Rockets fan. I didn't like Sean Kemp. I didn't like Gary Payton. I didn't like Detlef Shrimp. You get the point. I did not like George Carl. Mm-hmm. I was going for the Bulls in the fucking series. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying, but I still think uh, that's what I'm saying. I just feel like it, it. this documentary caters too much to Michael and is too subjective. That's my only opinion. There's no doubt, no about, doubt it. about it. You know, but most documentaries do have a subjective point of view. Uh, I, I, you know, even the ones that pretend to be objective, as soon as you point the camera somewhere, then you are es- establishing a point of view regarding the subject. It's in possible to be totally right. objective but you're absolutely right dan this is definitely a, a jordan michael yeah, jordan production the, there's no the subject of the documentary is the will to win of michael jordan I mean, that's all they talk about how much he motivated yeah. himself what he did he'd make up lies about things that happened to get himself motivated for the next game but episode seven which i think it's I think it's a worthy yeah, exactly. topic, that whole topic. Because yeah. everybody can emulate that will to win, to how to motivate themselves to yep. rise above. But the, uh, the Episode 7 has uh, the 1.8 seconds of Scotty Pippen. And he had said that, I wanted to ask you to get your take on us, but Scotty had said that he would do it all over the same again. What, what do you think about that, Aldo? I, I, I felt so horrible when I heard that. I said to myself... You know, even if you really fucking feel that way, you should have just said something else. For you to say that is just going to create so much Pippin hatred. And I hate to see, you know, Pippin being cast the way he is 
you know, during this series because Scottie Pippen was a defensive genius. He revolutionized, he originated the point forward position. He was the perfect partner for Michael Jordan, the absolute per- perfect partner. I remember listening to Mike North saying that he would trade Scottie Pippen for Sean Kemp. And I, I, ran home to call the show <laughs> and and I called the show and, and they said, well, we're on to a different topic. So we, we can't take your call. And I was going to ream Mike North off for saying that he wanted Sean Kemp over Scotty Pippen because I felt, and I'm not being a homer when I say this, I just felt like Scotty was so good in so many ways. Now he definitely just did some really fucking stupid things. And, and but when you know about his background and his his father in a wheelchair and his brothers and sisters and growing up penniless and stuff. You kind of got, you know, you kind of understand a little bit why he's such a prick and stuff. It doesn't forgive him for his injustices or his indiscretions. But I, I, I just felt when he said that, I just felt so bad. I said to myself, you fucking idiot. <laughs> why did you say that? <laughs> and the, uh, I'll come at it from a rocket's perspective because, uh, and I agree with you when, see, when after that, the championship, he goes to Houston. And uh, I watched that the next season is the one that the, you had the lockout initially. So mm-hmm. there were only 50 games off the top of my head. The Rockets were 31 and 19, I think. And so they had the big three that year, which was Elijah one Barkley and Pippen and Scotty, that whole 50 games whined and complained and said, Barkley was too fat and Barkley was too old and Barkley was out of shape. And he should be getting the ball more than Barkley. He never said anything bad about Akeem, so I'll give him that. But And then he complained about Rudy's offense. And the, the whole time, it's sort of like the, the he had the one playoff game where he had 37, but he kind of sabotaged that entire season. And again, I like Pippen too. But yeah, this documentary isn't doing him any favors, but he did have a propensity to seem to kind of just get down and, and, or just take a stance and 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 be hard-headed with it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the one thing I always said about Pippen, too, is that his legacy, imagine, because uh, this is sort of a conspiracy theory, but the 2000 Blazers were up 15 in Game 7 against the Lakers, and the Lakers had like 27 free throws in the fourth quarter to come back to win. But in that series, they were the Blazers were down 3-1, and they started basically running Pippen at the point guard the, the rest of the series. And and they came back and had a 15 point. My point is, imagine if Portland goes to the finals, maybe they beat Indiana, maybe Pippen's MVP, his legacy even is more heightened if he wins a title by himself. I think he's a great player, but yeah, the documentary, even Jordan kind of uh, come down on him for the headache too in the Eastern Conference Finals. It really has made him look poor, this uh, documentary. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. You're, I can't. You know, I, I I'm glad that you share that about the Rockets, his experience with the Rockets, because I had completely forgotten about that, and uh, you know that just kind of proves that you know Mike North may be right when he says Scotty Pippen is just a pure dick. <laughs> Pippen, uh, I again, I I didn't mind that trade initially. The one I really didn't want the Barkley trade because they traded Robert Ory and Sam Cassell yeah. to get Barkley, but I I really wanted Barkley to get that ring kind of the way Drexler did with the Rockets. So I was really really rooting for him. But yeah, it just didn't work. And Pippen and Barkley were constantly bickering that entire season. And I don't think they like each other at all. At least if they did, they didn't then. Mm, they, they made up afterwards. All right. So- but it's one thing you said on the Mike North the advantage. I, I didn't know about that NBA uh, countdown that, until you were referencing it. They've got Barkley really low on that. And um and they had Isaiah in the 30s. Again, I feel like I'm Isaiah's like ball washer now. But <laughs> And LeBron to be number two, that is com- like like Mike North said. I, I didn't see Will Chamberlain, but for LeBron to be number two, yeah. LeBron's better than Bird. He's better than Magic. He's better than Kareem. Get the fuck out of here. No fucking way. No yeah. fucking way. I mean, LeBron is a really, truly special athlete basketball number player. Two. 
Yeah, but he's not the number two all time uh, NBA player. Oh, no, Shaq, Shaq over Akeem. That made me want to like punch somebody. <laughs> yes, I am. I am with you. I've had Hakeem Olajuwon on my top ten NBA list. I do one like once a year, and it, it vacillates as much as people know how much I vacillate. I go up and down on stuff, and Olajuwon many times makes my top 10 list and every time he does people question Elijah you kidding me I don't even remember him playing for the Rock Akeem was so good that awesome. like, I said this a couple weeks ago Akeem was so good that he was drafted ahead of Michael Jordan and nobody questions it that's right that's imagine right. that anybody else drafted ahead of Jordan you'd be like what were they thinking Right. But nobody says the Rockets made the wrong move. And again, early on in his career, he was all power. He was terrible at the free throw line. He became a finesse player. Yep. In addition to his power, with great footwork, he became a great free throw shooter. And again, that first championship, he was defensive player of the year, league MVP and finals MVP in the same season. I mean, and the next year they were the sixth seed and won all. They beat the Magic with 60 wins, the Jazz, the Spurs. They humiliated David Robinson and uh, and the Suns, and they were down 3-1. They beat three teams with wins over 55, with over 55 victories that year, all on the road. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Akeem's legacy is cemented, in my opinion. Yeah, it bothers me that he, you know, so many other players are picked before him, and he's rarely in the discussion when you talk about the great NBA players. Rarely, it just just baffles me. I don't get it. The best center in my lifetime, for sure. Now, again, I didn't see Kareem when he was younger. I saw Kareem in the later days with the Lakers. Uh, again, he was still a solid player, but he's just shooting up that hook, you know. Uh, Elijah one just to me was the best center of his generation, without question. Yeah, uh, I think Kareem is not his generation, though. You know, right. athletically, uh, you don't get any better than uh, Will Chamberlain and Akeem Olajuwon. Those are two of the most athletic seven footers ever in the history of the game. No, I, I they were the two most athletic uh, centers, and uh, uh, Jabbar was was sil was silky smooth. He had that great shot, but yeah, he you know. There were some limitations to his game, and I think you know when people. Well, we're go talking too much basketball. Hard. Let's give Tooch back a show. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I make one more point? And I'll shut up about Akeem. Just one point. The eight, the '86 Finals. If you go back and watch that against Boston, again, it's all power, all dunks, and all like short little shots. He's scoring 40, but they're it's all inside moves. Right. And then go and watch '94, '95. It's a completely different player. And again, you could say he's finessed by that point. So I'm just saying he redefined his game and he was already great. But I digress. I'm, I'm listening sorry. in awe. You know, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad they showed some Dominique Wilkins dunking montage, too. That guy was the, you know, yeah. up there with Michael as far as dunking, you know. Yeah, I, I was in at CBS during that Chicago uh, dunk contest, and so I was back at the studio watching, and it was clear to me that Dominique got robbed. And yeah. the only reason Michael won the uh, dunk contest was because of homerism. And then Jordan uh, showed up. To the reason I was there was because I wanted to see Michael Jordan. He shows up at Channel Two because we we did a half hour special after the dunk contest, and so. Uh, I was sitting in the audience two rows away from from uh, Michael Jordan and just, you know, in awe. Great time. Did you ever have any interactions with him? Never got uh, a chance to talk to him. I didn't get, I, uh, you know, there were so many people in the green room wanting to get their picture taken and so forth. And I'm more of kind of a low-key guy, so I didn't do that. But John Paxson, I did. Walter Payton, I did. He came in for a Mike Ditka show type taping. And I got to shake uh, Sir Walter's hand, a, a couple of others. But with Michael, it, that was like, you know, Jesus Christ, man. Nobody could get near him. I assume Walter was good to you then, right? Great, great guy. Great, great guy. Very friendly and looked me straight in the eye when he shook my hand and almost broke every bone in it uh, a, a great experience great stories how about we get into a little news uh aldo i know you got a a clip you want to play we recently lost uh someone in the uh, tv world i i was gonna ask dan dan are you a uh, seinfeld fan i'm more of a curb your enthusiasm fan although i did watch seinfeld uh not every episode the way i do curb though 
I can't say in all honesty that I was a huge Seinfeld fan. There's a lot of episodes that I didn't see, but on Thursday nights, uh, when I was home, I would, I would watch that NBC lineup that they had on and I, and I really, really enjoyed Seinfeld and it's weird. You know, the more I see it now in my latter years, the more I, I, I like it even better. And the performance by Jerry Stiller as George Constanza's father is just one of the best things on, in a television sitcom I've ever seen. And I, I was fascinated by uh, Jerry Stiller because when I was a kid uh, in New York City watching the Ed Sullivan show, uh, Jerry Stiller was on the Ed Sullivan show multiple times with his then wife and Mira. They had a, a famous comedy duel and uh, so followed his career throughout. And so he passed away uh, this week at the age of 92. And I thought it would be nice to kind of pay him a tribute. I got right. a clip here from uh, the sign show yeah this is this is really special uh it's a little long it's a two minute uh, and 10 second clip uh but i i thought i'd play it out uh with uh john's permi permission he's gonna let me play the entire clip so let me set it up for you uh jerry stiller is uh of course like i said uh george Kenstanza's father and he's having dinner with his son and his wife on the show uh who was played by estelle uh what was her name estelle uh estelle getty not a, is it Stel Getty? Oh, I wrote it down somewhere. Now I can't find it. Uh, so the Golden Girls. Yeah, Stel Getty was in the Golden Girls. You're right. Uh, give her her name uh, at the other end. So, anyways, to set up the scene, they're having dinner, and uh, Jerry, uh, excuse me, uh, George Costanza is just piling on the ketchup onto his food, and then the conversation takes a turn as. Um, uh, George, who is always looking for a job, it seems, every episode I see of Seinfeld, uh, get some advice from his father, played by Jerry Stiller. Here it is. I talked to Phil Kasichoff today. My friend, the bra salesman, he says they're looking to maybe put somebody on, so I got you an interview next Friday with his boss. Next Friday? What time? Two o'clock. That's my whole afternoon! <laughs> I was going to look for sneakers! You can look for sneakers the next day! <laughs> he doesn't know anything about bras. I know a little. Besides, what do you have to know? Well, it wouldn't hurt to go in and be able to discuss it intelligently. Maybe you should take a look at a few bras. Where's your bra? Give him a bra to look at. I'm not giving him a bra. Why not? Because I don't need him looking at my bra. Fine, so he'll go into the interview. He wouldn't know what he's talking about. We have to. You don't even know what they're made from. They're made from lycra spandex. Get out of here. Lycra spandex? I think they are made from lycra spandex. You want to bet? How much you want to bet? I'm not betting. Take a look. All right, I'll get a bra. I don't know what the big problem is. Getting a bra. I'm not saying go to the library and read the whole history, but it wouldn't kill you to know a little bit about it. All right, it wouldn't kill me. How long does it take to find a bra? <laughs> What's going on in there? You ask me to get a pair of underwear, I'm back in two seconds. <laughs> you know about the uh, cup sizes and all? They have different cups. Yeah, I, I know about the cup. <laughs> you got the A, B, the C, the D. That's the biggest. I know the D is the biggest. I based my whole life on knowing that the D is the biggest. Here, here's the bra. Let me see it. 100% lycra spandex. Let me see I it. told you. Here, I think you know everything. <laughs> That's surprising. <laughs> All right, what else? You got the cups in the front, two loops in the back. All right. I guess that's about it. I got it. Cups in the front, loops in the back. You got ketchup on it. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> that was the great Estelle Harris, Estelle right. Harris as Estelle Costanza. Uh, of course, uh, Jason Alexander as George Costanza, and the fabulous, fabulous Jerry Stiller as uh, the father. And Jerry Seinfeld was on a podcast recently, and he said, you know, what he loved about Stiller's character is that he so completed the <laughs> George story. When you meet the father, you go, oh, now I understand why he's like that. And it's so true. And he also said on that podcast that during all the episodes that uh, Jerry Stiller taped, 
neither uh, Jerry Seinfeld or, or Larry Charles or anyone who was directing an episode ever gave Jerry Stiller a note. He played it perfectly from the very first day. It's like he had studied George Costanza and said, I know how to play to this guy's father. And and if you watch those episodes, it is just effing so incredible what a perfect compliment he was the, as the, as the father. Real life father of stuff. Ben Stiller. That's right. Yeah. The great Ben Stiller. Comedy you know, genius. <laughs> a show that I watched with my grandma a lot when I was a kid was called Tales from the Dark Side. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Sure. And there was an episode that Jerry Stiller was on where he played a, a guy, like a shock jock mm -hmm. on the radio that was a dick to everybody. And it was, of course, he meets his maker at the end or whatever. But I, that's what I remember him from. You say Jerry Stiller, obviously Seinfeld, but. As a kid, I watched that Tales from the Dark or Tales from the Dark Side episode. That's what makes me think of it more than anything. Oh, I'll have to look for that. It's called The Devil's Advocate. Uh, Jerry Stiller is in it. Then I definitely didn't remember that, but yeah. Well, I didn't remember either. I did a quick Google search. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> All right, yeah, it was excellent. Although, good thank stuff. you for oh. that. Uh, it was uh, passed away on May 11th at the age of 92. Good long life. I got one other news story I'll share, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, Mandalorian. In fact, I've never seen an episode of it. <laughs> I Great thought show. you guys would get a kick out of this. Cause I think, I think uh, Dan, are you into that show? I'm not sure what it is. The Dan Mandalorian has never is seen uh, part of the Wars. Star Wars. Oh, yeah, I've never watched a Star Wars movie. I, I was a dick last week and made a joke and said that I, I liked pussy too much to like star wars which I, was <laughs> for, for me to say that i apologize uh but yeah i've never watched one star wars movie never well i i've seen a uh, a handful i saw the first three didn't like the first one uh and when i say the first three i mean the middle trilogy star wars i didn't really particularly care for it i thought the empire strikes back was really good because it had a real director directing that one and then the third one came out with the ewoks and i i said what the, what the fuck is this get, get me the fuck out of here anyway the mandalorian uh one reason to watch that show is because timothy oliphant is uh, been uh, cast as one of the actors. Uh, Hollywood Reporter is exclusively reporting. Hol Oliphant, you may remember, was on the HBO show Deadwood and uh, and also on the FX series that ran for six seasons called Justified. That was an excellent show. And uh, so Timothy Oliphant, who also was in one one of my favorite movies called Go. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. He plays a drug dealer in Go, and it's an uh, episodic. Was Jay Moore in that? Uh, yeah, Jay Moore was in it. Yeah, I remember Go. I liked Go, too. Yeah, excellent movie. I re highly yeah. recommend that. But So Timoth Timothy Oliphant is in the cast, and so maybe maybe I'll look at an episode or two to see how, how he's doing in that. Take it away, uh, John Santucci. Uh, also, I think uh, Ros Rosario Dawson and Temura Morrison will be in uh, the cast next year, too. Both really good actors. Yeah, and last week we talked about how the quarantine Netflix gained 16 million new subscribers, which is going to see an increase in the quality of content and possibly challenging HBO. Of course, this Sunday, Snowpiercer debuts on TNT, the series starring Jennifer Connelly based on the 2014 South Korean cult movie by Parasite director Bong Joon-ho. Right now, I've been watching new episodes of Rick and Morty. They're out now on Cartoon Network and uh, Hulu. May 22nd episode of Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet on Apple TV is called Quarantine and is filmed entirely on FaceTime, the application on Apple iPhones. So catch that show on Apple TV. New episodes of F is for Family start arriving June 12th on Netflix. And HBO Now is now set to go away completely as being replaced by HBO Max on May 27th. The new streaming service will feature new and exclusive content. Also, a new series based on the Percy Jackson novels are in development at Disney+. Plus. No release date has been set. And Robert Downey Jr. is developing a live-action series for Netflix based on the DC comic book Sweet Tooth. The series will follow the story of Gus, part boy and part deer, who leaves his home in the forest to find the outside world ravaged by a cataclysmic event. He joins a ragtag band of humans and human-animal hybrids like himself in search of answers about the new world and about the mystery behind his own hybrid origins. Also coming up on July 3rd, Disney Plus will release a recording of the musical Hamilton, filmed live at the Richard Rogers Theater, and I've never seen it. I've always wanted to see Hamilton. Either of you guys see Hamilton? Yeah. Yeah, Never July seen it. I'm dying to see the TV Disney version. Plus. 
You seen it, Dan? Did you uh, travel up to New York to see it? No, I'm not a Broadway kind of guy. <laughs> I think guy, uh, I Joey Two Scoops has seen it several times. Uh, yeah. Have you? Wow. Not surprised. Joey's such a cultured man. Uh, but one of the reasons I want to see it is that they promised that this is not going to be a, a taped version of the play, that it's going to be a cinematic experience. So uh, so that makes makes me happy. Uh, because I like movies more than the theater. So uh, we'll see what it looks like when it's released. When when is the release? Uh, The Disney Plus really paying off for me with the kids. It's $6.99 a month. So they've got everything on there from old cartoons, you know, to new stuff, to Marvel movies, everything. So let's, uh, let's talk about a little, before we wrap it up, talk a little, I know this much is true on HBO. And uh, initial thoughts, uh, Aldo, on the Mark Ruffalo uh, sort of depressing <laughs> show, but what? very well done, very well acted, and very well written. Well, I'm with you there. This is a uh, a really, really difficult show to see. I saw episode one earlier today, and from what I've read about uh, the rest of the series, it gets tougher and tougher to watch this is a story of twin brothers one of them uh, is a a paranoid schizophrenic and uh in one of the opening scenes something terrible happens and then it just goes downhill from there (laughs) so uh very very difficult but if you uh if you want to uh invest into a show with tremendous acting that takes a look at the seriousness of mental illness, um, and um, and aren't are, you know aren't afraid to invest during a time where we're all depressed as hell because of COVID nineteen and how it's you know changed our lives. If you still have the kind of the courage to invest time into something that is really really dark and depressing. Then I say check the show out because again the acting is is phenomenal and um, and the direction is top notch. Uh, what's the name of the director? Uh, Der- do you Derek do you recall it? A guy that's done a couple, yeah, he's he done did, a couple uh, of feature films. Yeah, what's the name uh, of that film he did? It's like Blue Blue yeah, Valentine. Yeah, uh, Blue right? Valentine. I have which not I have, seen it either, but I, I heard that's another depressing thing. I, I, I've been told if. This this will ruin marriages if you see see this thing. And there was another movie that he directed that's also really really dark. So this guy loves to uh, delve into dark films. Uh, I'm dying to hear yeah, what uh, Dan thinks about it. I don't want to bring anybody down. I don't want to make this my personal therapy session. But my dad had a similar diagnosis as Ruffalo's uh, uh, twin, and I, I'm not going to try to say that my dad was cutting off appendages or anything like that, but. I saw a lot of um, that type of disposition and behavior uh, growing up. Again, and I'm not any different than anybody else. I'm not trying to say, oh, please feel sorry for me. I'm just saying, but watching this, it's kind of, it is difficult only because I kind of make it my own and sort of relate to the other version of Mark Ruffalo. And I know that basically my dad was running from Vietnam so one side of him was either fucked up on drugs or really, really wanting to make a commitment to God and being super religious. And that was going to be his way to forget the jungle, you know? So the fact that he was in the library and thinking he was making a sacrifice to oppose uh, Desert Storm uh, being Ruffalo's character there, his, the, the other twin. Uh, again, it's not something specific that my dad did, but it it's kind of in the ballpark of things that it feels realistic oh, is what brutally, I'm trying to say. Brutally, painfully realistic. realistic. Yeah. It, but it's so good. Uh, not to, to sub reference anymore, but there was a scene, a movie called brothers with Jake Gyllenhaal where he goes ballistic and like, uh, tears yes, up this kitchen demolition. because uh, they thought he, great movie. Yeah. They thought that he was dead and his brothers started fucking his girl in it. And, that scene is another one where it just sticks out as something that feels so real that it's something his, I would have seen as a kid. His girlfriend had a, and that's had a son about the rough that he kind of like, uh, the son had some, uh, you know, sexual identity issues, but cursed a lot. And, and Jake Gyllenhaal, there's a great scene. I think I recorded just that exchange between him and the boy where the boy would always say fuck all the time. And he would be like, you know, you're not using that word correctly. And then he'd give him the, the lecture of how to use fuck. 
correctly. Great scene. The movie is called Demolition. <laughs> no, the Brothers. one that's okay. called Brothers. You're talking Jake Gyllenhaal destroying yeah, he goes the, to uh, war. the kitchen. Yeah, he goes to the war and they think he's dead. So his brother's comforting his, his wife. It's kind of the way Bobby Kennedy was allegedly fucking Jackie on the side after Jack gets killed. Was oh. you know, He's comforting her. He wants to be there for her, but they start fucking. And suddenly Gyllenhaal comes back from the war. He was a POW. Oh. He comes back from Afghanistan, well, and yeah. One. So then, you know, yeah, yeah. So they they built this whole movie. They build this kitchen. Mm. They're renovating the kitchen. I think it maybe is Natalie and, Portman, but in I, this I, movie, I can't remember uh, for sure. If it's uh, there. Dominic wanted to remodel the kitchen as well. You know, I'm wondering uh, now the 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 uh, that's right. The right. two uh, good the two brothers. It was said in the in the first episode that they were born on New Year's Eve. One was born in 1949. Six minutes later, the uh, Thomas, the mentally handicapped one, was born in 1950. So they had different selective service uh, draft card numbers. Was said now 1950 uh, <laughs> with the Vietnam War, they would have been, or at least Dominic would have been eligible for uh, Vietnam. But uh, I, Dominic, I mean uh, Thomas, probably had no chance of serving with his condition. But I wonder if if we're going to see if Dominic was in uh, in Vietnam, Danny. What do you think? I have no uh, no way of knowing, and you have to also question Thomas's condition. Is it one of those things that it's stress related, or what was the catalyst for him uh, being diagnosed, or is he just going to be always messed up from youth on, or did something catastrophic happen that sort of he can't snap out of? Uh, so I, I'm interested to see where they play that. Um, if I could pivot just for a moment and call an audible and ask your opinion on something too, because I've been talking a lot. And the, one of the things I've questioned, and again, it, to make it a little lighthearted from the seriousness of the topic, uh, I'm yes. a huge fan of Juliette Lewis. You know, she was nominated for an Academy she Award for her portrayal in uh, the De Niro. No, no, the uh, Cape, uh, Fear, yeah. Cape Fear. And I love natural born killers. I love, and she's only 20 years old now. But anyway, my question is, I got two theories, and now you all are both men, so you, you tell me here, because I even rewound it with the subtitles. There's a scene where Mark Ruffalo is like dancing and they're playing George Michael mm -hmm. it, with Juliette Lewis. And then suddenly she starts crying and is pissed off, and as we know, it seems to have quit her job like, and cr has a transcript. Cringy scene. Did she get mad at him because either A, he got an erection, or B, Maybe she touched him and he didn't get an erection because then he says to her, he said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm really, uh, I'm really, uh, did he say he was stressed or I'm really nervous is what he said. He said, I'm so sorry, I'm really nervous. So it made me think that he couldn't get hard. For some reason, she takes whatever he did personally, out. starts crying and then quits. So I, what I, happened? It was just like he, 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 uh, what happened? he didn't want to, didn't, didn't feel any attraction toward her. I don't know. Although, what do you think? I, I took it that way, but I. I'll have to watch it again to to give you a better answer. I thought definitely that he could not get an erection, and he apologized for it. And she took, she felt like you know why? Well, what's wrong with me? And that's when she totally, yeah. totally lost it. I'm sure it was that he he could not get hard, and which is why he was right, so apologetic. And then, of course, uh, she never finishes the manuscript. That was one thing, Dan. Dan, you and I talked about this offline about. Uh, the the things that she said yeah. about uh, he, he uh, Dominic had asked her what kind of a man was my grandpa like and she was she had said it summed it up I, I would not allow him around kids you know that's right so he do you think he's the dad the, this right is the, we got to ask the grandfather Waldo, it's also his dad. Uh, Dan and I think that the grandfather is Dominic and Thomas's father that raped his, their mother which is why the mom. Him. That's why the mom who their father tell him, was all the time. Yeah. Did you get that, Aldo? Or that's why she came to the right. trans. Yeah, I did. He wanted get to know that. all and, these years. Uh, the only from, way he was uh, going to find out was by translating the fucking book. Right, and and so that is the big reveal. It is rumored that is going to happen in the final episode. We're going to find out who is the the true father yeah. of the of the twins. Did, so uh, did you make that that's connection where that's today? Oh. Okay. <laughs> No, I did not. I, I, I after I watched the episode and I started reading a couple of articles, yeah. I said, "Oh, okay." I she think would I know what's say, going I don't want to here. talk about yeah. who your I father wonder, is, I, and then gave him the manuscript, 
And then, of course, he had to translate. And I, I think she knew he'd never get it translated before she passed away. But Yeah. Now, this is completely ignorant on my part. I don't know if there's any connection to it, but it makes me wonder, is there a chance, I mean, scientifically, if there is an incest case like that, could that have led to Ruffalo's brother's Absolutely. mental, you know, his problems, yeah. his diagnosis? I. I'm no doctor, but I, I I think so, absolutely. So perhaps that's why his brother is also off kilter too, because he's a victim of incest. Right. What was it that they uh, one one brother said he's got a frontal lobe uh, issue? Uh, he he, he provided the scientific chemicals reasoning imbalance. To, I thought he I said. Yeah, chemical imbalance, frontal lobe issue, whatever. But yeah, I think a lot of that happen sometimes when there, there's incest. The involved, stepdad so, wanted yeah. to raise the boys a little harsher. Her mom would never let them. The stepdad was kind of like a half step away from being a dick, but I, I, I don't know. I get the feeling he was like, okay. No, but no, maybe we'll find out so. more about his character. Uh, I think his name is Ray. I mean, he's, he's like he's like punching five-year-olds because their okay. elbows on the table. I mean, get, I, did, I didn't see make that the when they were kids. Like, him, he, he just slapped him. Well, he smacked him or whatever. I'm saying, like, if you're smacking a five-year-old because his elbow's on the table, mm-hmm. could you imagine that being your kid? A oh. five? Yeah. No. Not good. Yeah, the, uh, he's an asshole, man. I mean, I know it's an era, though. If you're talking to Eisenhower administration, I'm sure you could just beat the <laughs> fuck out of your kids and nobody cares. I got plenty of belts and yardsticks when I was a kid, man. I'll tell you. Oh, <laughs> my gosh, yeah. Extension cable. <laughs> that was a different time back then, though. But yeah, I wanted to uh, oh my God. Uh, talk about Mark Ruffalo's physical transformation to play these two roles. One brother, of course, is heavier. And the other brother is thinner. Mm-hmm. Dominic is much thinner than his his, uh, his brother Thomas, and for the I, it, I feel like it's two different people. I'm watching when I, the acting is so mm-hmm. fantastic. I think it would be a travesty if he isn't if he isn't at least nominated. I think he should win something. I, I haven't seen a performance this good in quite a while by uh, Mark Ruffalo. What do you think about the train? I know obviously they had to have. When they were filming the scenes, he's talking to someone who's heavier when he's thin, and you see him from the back. And then when it's the opposite way, it's someone thinner right. dressed like Dominic, you know, and then they're facing Tom, the camera's facing Thomas. But what do you what do you think about the physical transformation and, and how how he really separated the two characters? I was watching it. We, we, I kind of referenced this a few weeks ago when I was saying that it was about to come on. This I couldn't. I can never remember the uh, the name of the series. I was like the Mark Ruffalo series, uh, but I saw him talking about it, and he said, "I don't recall if he said he he was heavier first or slimmer first, but it was a twenty pound discrepancy between the two characters, and that right. was legitimate. That wasn't made up or." CGI or something, he did either gain or lose 20 pounds. I, again, I don't know the sequential order, but that kind of commitment that I don't really like Christian Bale, but he's done sure. that on several movies too. And I can't be good for you, uh, your health, but I mean, obviously that's a hell of a commitment for the role. And I agree with you in terms of like, that's gotta be some sort of Emmy consideration yeah. on its own. Uh, I could think of mm-hmm. uh, uh, raging bull of Robert De Niro's transformation. Uh, during that movie, uh, as as another one, I think the mechanic right, right. was the Christian Bale movie you're talking about. And uh, although, how about the Mark Ruffalo acting in this series? Impressed? It's oh, it's phenomenal. And and to Dan's point, yeah, about adding the weight, he was quoted. Ruffalo was quoted as saying that, you know, he was actually looking forward to adding the weight they filmed the, the scenes of dominic uh the the lighter okay. of the twins first and then oh. he, he he they took they stopped filming for four or five weeks so that he could gain the 20 to 30 pounds uh and he was really looking forward to it but he's uh, he's quoted as saying you know what when you're force feeding yourself <laughs> the romanticism of eating just went out the window and a later he hated it and so but it, it it is up there with robert de niro's uh transformation in raging bull when de niro uh uh gained all that weight to play uh the elderly jake lamada it truly is you know uh, uh, just a testament to how seriously this guy takes his acting and so it's not only a physical transformation but it's also just totally engaged in every word that he utters every action and i totally totally bought that these were two separate uh 
two separate yeah, actors really playing this role. And you really do. I'm- yeah, the way it's photographed too really helps that too. You know, you got the camera on one guy, and, the, and then the camera pans yeah. over, and there's the other two guy. Diff- it's like completely amazing. Di- two Pretty distinct cool. personalities he brings life to in this movie, and uh, that I find very impressive. Mm-hmm. Now, Melissa Leo is the actress who plays their mom, and she is an Academy Award winner in her own right for the movie The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg. Don't know if you guys ever saw that movie. But yeah, very Great good movie. movie. Great, Great movie. Great yeah. movie. Christian Bale also. Christian in that Bale's one, right? in that. We haven't seen Rosie O'Donnell. She's in this movie as well. Um, and of course, we mentioned Juliette Lewis with the, with the, quite a performance. She played that perfect uh, kind of like uh, cat lady, uh, single uh, spinster, you know, <laughs> uh, partier chick. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> Looking mighty hot, I thought. Oh, I was sure. like, oh, we're going to get a great sex scene here. <laughs> nope, we can't get up. <laughs> yeah, but that, that scene was very cringy. <laughs> now, uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. But very realistic. Too, very realistic. Too, very do, you realistic. Think, do we see. Yes. Do we see uh, her character's name is Nidra, the translator? You think we see her again? I imagine we'd have to if he's going to find out, you know, uh, if he's ever going to read the book that his grandfather wrote, uh, which is in Italian. And, uh, yeah, I looked at the cast uh, in, on IMDb, and it says that she's in all six episodes. So that's good news, I think, because okay. I, I love her acting. Would her character have really quit her job, though, because of that experience? That's the only criticism I have of the first episode. Yeah, that, that was really weird. Was it, uh, was but it a job? I, perhaps it was kind of like an office that. she did freelance work, though. Was it? I guess she was employed because he came in there and complained yeah. about her or something, but... Her, I did they say she didn't course. work for the university? Yeah, didn't she, they say that uh, when he was complaining? He went oh, to the, he went I to complain that. about how she ripped off his manuscripts, you know, and he started throwing shit around yeah, in, the, in uh, the office. He's like, she's not an employee. She just, you know. I think th- I think that she was an employee, and what they were saying to him was that you hired okay. her directly, not, through the, not okay. through the university, and that so that's sense. the problem to deal with her. <laughs> If I can digress a moment, you know, we were talking about Ruffalo playing the twins. There's an article on the insider.com. There have been 14 actors oh, who wow. play their own twins on screen. Yeah. Can you, off the top of your head, can you name any uh, of them? The Jeremy Irons and no. Dead Ringers. That's the one oh, that comes to mind. That was a wild an movie. David Cronenberg, movie. I think, was the director of that one. That's uh, I'm you're trying. absolutely right. Dan, you ever seen. Uh, um, um, De- uh, dead what's the name dead of Ringers, <laughs> David Cronenberg yeah. film. Dead Ringers. Uh, never seen. Danny DeVito I've and Arnold seen. Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Dan, you're kind of... <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Dan, this is your kind of... Oh, yeah, you got us. They're, they're gynecologist twins <laughs> with bizarre sex That's addictions. Right. <laughs> I would definitely... <laughs> <laughs> really yeah, bizarre movie. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> I will watch uh, it. A couple of other. Like, I'm well, can, to yeah, think. can you come uh, up with another one, John? Oh boy, I, off the top of my head, no. Just the Jeremy Irons twins. I, I'm sure as soon as you start. Uh, uh, Army Hammer in the. Uh, yeah, what about Army Hammer who played the entrepreneurial twins in the yeah. Social Network? Now I remember the Facebook movie. The Facebook Jay, uh, movie? Eisenberg, yeah, Jesse Facebook. Eisenberg. Uh, yeah, I, thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was a dud. I, just didn't, I didn't even remember that. Oh, I thought that was an excellent movie. Uh, uh, I won't go through all 14, but I'll just uh, yeah. list two more for you. Lindsay Lohan mm. playing the parent okay. trap about twins. <laughs> <laughs> and she also did it again in a 2007 thriller called I Know uh, Who no, Killed You me. Killed Me. I saw that. <laughs> That I, was a dreadful uh, movie, but I did see that. Was, uh, <laughs> it sounds dreadful was Jeremy movie. Irons on that list? Yeah, I don't see him, so clearly oh, the list okay. doesn't cover wow. everybody. So, uh, Bette Midler played uh, Twins uh, in Big Business. Uh, uh, Eddie Murphy has been known to play multiple right. characters in films, but right. never Twins. So, anyways, uh, interesting uh, concept there. I uh, I think Ruffalo is going to be remembered perhaps yeah, as doing it the best of anyone because like, this might be the best anyone's ever done twins before. But yeah, yeah, that episode one is extraordinary. So if he continues that for the next episodes, give him the yeah, Emmy. I Send it to him now. This, uh, <laughs> show if if you're not uh, if you're not too worried about being too depressed. It is a little depressing, but it's so well done and so well acted. It's hard to to look away. 
to be honest. But, uh, the most powerful line I thought of the first episode was when Thomas, the brother, was in the hospital and they were holding him down and trying to reattach the hand. And he said, I think oh it was God. in your trailer when you set it up earlier, too. He was like, for, for one time, yes. would you fucking stand up for me and or something to that like, effect? It's his yeah. own Man, choice. That is, oh. you know, and everyone else is like, what are you talking about? You know? But, you know, that's what he wanted. Yeah, that's deep shit, man. It, it, and uh, when, when they were taking him away to the other, uh, I mean, he was used to being, you know, working and living at that one uh, institution, which was a little more uh, lenient. And now they put him into a tougher home. Now, was he missing his hand at that point? I can't remember. I know he was like he had to go to the bathroom so bad. That's okay. when he was getting released after right. uh, uh, his right. hand got. Gotcha. Yeah. That's correct. I'm That's guessing correct. the new, the second hospital, again around that same time frame, the early '90s. I was at the VA's a lot with my dad. I'm guessing the one he went to, the second, right. the one he didn't want to be at, was probably like an electric shock Perhaps, treatment uh, facility, where they're probably going to fuck him up with that shit. So that's probably. Well, I don't know if they're going to give me a lobotomy. It's more of a, you know, yeah, it was, it's, uh, that's more of an Eisenhower kind of thing. This too, era, yeah, you're right. We're, we're, we're in 1990 right. by that point. Remember, the reason he did it was his opposition to right. the Desert Storm War. Uh, so yeah, I'm thinking it's probably he's in elect an electric shock treatment facility that they're trying to preclude him from going into uh that thomas's right. brother Dominic. what's his, uh, the other name yeah Dominic. all right lecture i'm guessing because that's the, the kind of shit i right. saw anyway with my dad all so. right mm -hmm. well i've reached the end of the show thanks both of you for being here uh it was a great show so i loved listening to all the basketball talk and uh the, the uh yeah go ahead i Danny. got one more thing for you close that one Two of my favorite movies ever. They're they're both old now, but but they both have Mark Ruffalo in it. And again, I'm just advocating and saying if you you were telling me to watch Dead Ringers, I got two for you. If you, you haven't count seen on me, one uh, he's not uh, now. One he's not the main character or anything, but it's a great movie. It's called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That's probably my favorite movie. It's mm. from 2004. Yeah, Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, you know Mark Ruffalo, but um. The second one, he does a great job, is called right. Zodiac, about right. the killer in San Francisco, with Jake Gyllenhaal also and Robert Downey movie, Jr. Yeah. from 2005. Did you see? Great film. You well, can, uh, you can count on me. But they filmed it. Now that's, uh, I have uh, not seen that. Aldo, did you see that one? You can count. That's Mark you Ruffalo and Laura me. Linney from Ozark. Well, if you do see that oh, one, that one is oh, great. Yes. Mark Ruffalo Excellent. plays the wayward yes. brother. Uh, who comes back into his sister's life. Yes. Uh, it's very good movie. Mm-hmm. He's great in Zodiac. Yeah. With well, I haven't seen it. He's great in that. Yeah. Hey, I got one for you. Uh, I Lost My Body. Uh, it's a <laughs> French animated movie that was nominated uh, for Best Animated Feature. And it, it follows a, a young man who gets his hand sliced off at the start of the movie. Now you know why I'm bringing this right. up. It's an animated movie. And then for, for the rest of the movie, the hand is trying to find its way back to its owner to reconnect. And so the film, this beautifully animated film, follows this this hand as it battles against a giant rat, <laughs> as it goes through s the city streets and so forth. And, and it is just a super, super animated film. It is subtitled because uh, it, it is a French film. Oh, nice. But if I you love animation body. and you love something, talking, uh, I lost my hand body. Went through that uh, earthquake this theater, also. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Immediately made me think of two other films when you said that. Moonstruck. Oh, Nicholas yeah. Cage's character loses his hand early on in a bread machine or whatever. When he's Cher looks so good with that curly hair. I yeah, she sure did. Yep. Yeah, and uh, the other one being Evil Dead Two with oh, that great movie. Second hand. Yeah. So <laughs> finger and stuff. Yeah. I showed that to my daughter when she was oh, four years twisted. old. <laughs> <laughs> The first one's superior, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I agree. But uh, those Evil Dead movies, and even the TV show was, I think, on Showtime. Was, yeah, was stopped, the director's was doing stuff on stop. Quibi I right now. It. I was telling, talking about that last week. He's doing that 50 States of Fear. Sam Raimi exactly. on uh, Quibi. The episodes are six minutes long around there on Quibi. He did, a really, he did a decent movie that came out last year called Crawl with uh, alligators in Florida during a flood. 
It wasn't yes. too overly CGI. I thought the alligators looked real, and the, oh, the movie was pretty one. good. I've, I've I heard about it. With, I've yeah. forgotten about it. Yeah, the Evil Dead director did that one, too. Yeah, I forgot that he did that. You're right. Uh, that is a good film. I liked it as well. Well, thanks again, fellas. Uh, and, uh, of course, the babies have woken up. Sorry about that. <laughs> My wife's going to work on the front lines uh, of, uh, of uh, the hospital tonight with uh, you know De- Des Moines having the... Uh, having the uh, out, latest outbreak here so uh she is getting ready to head to head to work I wish but, yeah well. thanks again fellas and uh we will see uh, the audience if i have a stream next week hopefully we have uh another surprise guest Aldo. wow yes i think uh that could uh, happen we won't say anything until we get nice. a confirmation but uh yeah it should be a special uh friday i have a stream next Wrapping next friday up, yep. uh, aaron coming back don't know yet. aaron has been moving he but he's a homeowner now so uh next Next week, we we'll wrap it right, up right, the last right. dance and talking right. more. I know uh, this much is true. All right. Thanks, fellas. Uh, thanks to all the barflies, too, for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. It's a pandemic. Let's have some fun. <laughs> <laughs>